Welcome to Wildfire Watch. This summer has been our busiest ever for wildfires. We have drought, we have climate change, we have out of control wildfires. This new series is designed to address your concerns, to answer your questions, and provide information that's gonna keep you and your family safe. We have a big focus this year on residents. What are their concerns? So let's hear from a short video to find out what's on residents' minds. I've lived in Marin since 1960. This is, I do believe, the worst drought I have seen. I'm really concerned with the drought and all the fires that we will run out of water to fight these fires. One of my greatest concerns is that ignitions could happen in the hills. I'm really not concerned. I mean, there's fires all over the place. There's been fires for like the past years back. It has been getting worse from climate change, but there's nothing we can really do. It feels so much bigger um, and out of our control of how to stop them. And I spent a lot of time in the Sierra and you can just tell that the fuel load is unmanageably high in the forest and that these areas are meant to burn, but they're just not. I'm really worried about the air quality, especially me as an athlete. I won't be able to go to school. As a resident of Madrone Canyon, I'm most worried for fires. If there's a fire that starts towards the bottom, we have no way of getting out. There's only one entrance, one exit. When things are this dry, fires seem inevitable. And I, it's, it's kind of a helpless feeling. Like I don't know how much you can really do. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. We can always do things to protect ourselves, even if what that means is have all of your important papers in one place, in a go bag know where they are and get in your car and get out. Don't wait because, oh, maybe it won't come here. Then you can go home if it doesn't come there. But if it does and you wait, you are potentially putting yourself and the first responders at risk. So as we've heard, the wildfire threat is real for all of us. My name is Rich Shortall. I'm the executive coordinator of FireSafe Marin. FireSafe Marin is committed to help us to adapt to living with wildfire. If you live in Lake Tahoe, you need to be able to adapt to living with snow. Here in Marin, we need to be able to make our homes safe by far smart landscaping, taking care of our vegetation, and then hardening the homes themselves. We're here to help you learn how to take those simple steps. This program is made possible by funding from the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. We have several exciting things planned during this season. First though, let's hear from the front lines of a very major fire that took place in Sonoma, and we're gonna find out firsthand what a firefighter experience was like at that fire. Reverse 911 in evacuation order when you're ready. Affirmative. Uh, go ahead. Evacuation order for Highway 128, north of Calistoga, all the way to the Sonoma County line, all of the Trans Valley School Road. The fire is currently burning northwest towards France Valley School. Send any resources from the Green Fire to the Atlas Fire. Here at uh, Mountain Home Ranch Road, the fire has crossed the road heading over towards um, Porter Creek Road. We have multiple structure loss up here. We've got multiple evacuations we can't get through. Uh, we're a single resource, the only one up here. Send any copies. Our priority is rescue of the public and safety of the rescuer. Suppression where possible, but our priority is evacuations and rescue of the public for life safety. Copy. You're going to be utilizing all resources. You're going to be utilizing a check and go tactic out in the head of the fire. I want you to switch over to D Fire 25, contact operations. Copy. ATC, South IC. Ready for additional evacuation orders. Subs I see Saint Helena affirmative. Evacuate from Sonoma County, Calistoga Road, and Harville Road, east of the city of Calistoga, and all adjoining roads, Porter Creek, and Petrified Forest. Saint Helena copies Calistoga Road and Harville Road, as well as Porter Creek. We've already done an evacuation order for Petrified Forest.
Well, that was one very dramatic video. Probably somewhat terrifying for most of us who've never had an opportunity to be in a situation like that before. Fortunately today, we have a frontline firefighter who has responded to fires just like that, is gonna tell us a little bit about just what it's like. Let me introduce Captain Oscar Reynas from the Ross Valley Fire Department. Oscar, welcome. Thank you, Rich. So what's it like to be the first on the scene of an out of control, crazy wildfire like that? Well, in the video that we just saw, it is really imperative now that evacuations take a priority. So the first thing that we're thinking of is we go over dispatch and we tell them there are certain neighborhoods that we know that we prepare for these evacuations. So being mindful of that, you can tell dispatch, hey, I need certain neighborhoods to be evacuated immediately. We have a fire that is out of control and that's really our priority. So in the fire service, we have a hierarchy of where our priorities are. Life safety, property, and energy, uh, environment conservation. Yeah. Well, life safety, obviously top priority there, right? So sometimes you're not the first one on the speed. So what's it like? Is it well organized there? Is it kind of chaotic? Yeah, so it is a chaotic scene, but we practice so much that it isn't chaotic in our minds. So as a first in officer, I know that my priority is life safety. So we start out with evacuations and then being the first in officer, I have the most knowledge of that scene, whether it's a career fire where it's gonna be 50, 100 plus acres, or it's gonna be a one or two acre fire. So as the first in officer, I determine that. And as a first in officer, I will direct my engines that are coming, um, where to place them. And in Marin County, we have a lot of single lane roads that lead up to hills. Mm -hmm. So that should be in the forefront of our minds to make sure that we're gonna evacuate those people and not have engines get stuck as they go up. Uh, I can see that being a real problem. So let's say we've successfully evacuated everybody. Second level priority is structure protection. So how do you decide which houses to save? First one that's in the line of fire or how's that work? Correct, Rich, and this is a huge topic. So there are many things as a first and officer that I'm looking at. Clearly there are fire behavior, topography, where we're at, what time of day it is. But if we're just looking at the structure of the home, yes, there are certain things that uh, as a crew and a fire officer, we look at and we look at what type of home it is. If you have a shingled roof, if you have a shingle siding, well, that is propensity for if an ember comes, that's gonna start first. The other things past looking at the home, okay, well, what defensible space have they created, right? So there are certain numbers that we attach to that. We want 30 feet around the home and 100 feet past that to be clear, to not have vegetation. But in Marin County, that is very difficult to accomplish. So in the minimum, hey, we want 30 feet where vegetation isn't your touch, your home, your vegetation isn't touching the home. So we have a defensible chance to save that home. Great. So um, you have a lot of decisions to make when you're out there. And sometimes you can save a home and sometimes you can't. What do you think residents is the most important thing they could do to help make your job easier? Yeah, that's a very good question. And there are certain things that we look at right away. Uh, hopefully every homeowner leaves a front door for us because typically when people are evacuating, they forget either to close windows or close sliding doors. So we, it is very imper imperative for us to make access into the home so we are able to close those homes. Um, not only that, but sometimes what we'll be able to use is use their water that they have. And sometimes we use garden hoses to fill our tanks up. A secondary, we do a perimeter around the home and we make sure because people have fireplaces, the number one thing that we notice that people leave is their fire lumber around the home. Oh. So again, that is just another way a member can find its way yeah. into the home and start a structure fire. Well, one of the questions which you answered well that we get from the public all the time is, do I leave the doors locked or unlocked? That's the reason that you leave them unlocked. So you can get in, seal the house up for them. And of course, leave your garden hoses connected, whatnot. Sometimes a little emperor comes, it's a handy thing for firefighters to be able to use and put it out. So our last question to you, we've all seen the picture of the heroic resident, giant flyers coming towards him. He's up on the roof and he's got his garden hose to save his home. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, so <laughs> as a firefighter, that is probably one of the scariest things that we will encounter because, again, our hierarchy of priority is life safety. So if we're going into a home and now we see the property owner there, well, your house just became secondary because our priority now is evacuating, evacuating you out of your home. And now our engine that was there to protect your house is now evacuating you away from your home. So that's one of the things that we hope we don't get into, but you made that decision for us. Right. So large scale wildfire, out of control, heavy wind conditions, that garden hose is going to do much to save the property. Not much good at all. They actually <laughs> say that if everybody in their neighborhood would open up their garden hose and put them on their roofs and have their sprinklers, you're actually damaging the water system. So the water that we need for fire hydrants to put out the structure homes or to stop the wildfire coming, it's actually prohibiting us to having the full amount of water supply that we need. Well, I think those are some real good tips for our audience out there. Oscar, I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. Very helpful. We hope to have you back in the future. Thank you, Rich, of course. All right, great. So now that we have a sense of what it's like, we need to find out how do these fires spread so rapidly? It's really not a tsunami of flame, even though we were talking a little bit about that. It's really thousands and thousands of wind-blown embers, sometimes blowing a mile in advance of a fire out there. They land in flammable vegetation around the home, and before you know it, the home is on fire. So today, we have a little demonstration for you put on by Quinn Gardner from the Ross Valley Fire Department. I think this would be a very interesting video for all of us to watch. Hi, I'm Quinn Gardner, the Emergency Manager for the City of San Rafael. I manage our Wildfire Prevention and Defensible Space Program. We get a lot of questions from residents about what they can do to adapt their landscape to living with wildfire. One of the best things you can do is help prevent the spread of any wildfire by reducing ember ignitions. Today we have a quick demonstration to show you how embers behave in different vegetation and what you can do to adjust your landscape. So let's go. There are three main ways fire spreads, direct heat, radiant heat, and embers. Embers are pieces of burning material that blow in the wind over a mile ahead of a main fire. Where those embers land can start new fires that can directly threaten your home. I have some different materials here to mimic the different types of materials that could be an ember on fire blowing towards your home or landscape. As you can see, nothing got stuck in this tree. However, let's take a look at where the embers landed. Down here, we can see them scattered amongst leaf litter and bark. If these, if these embers ignited this bark, it could spread fire across the landscape. However, because this tree has no low limbs and there's no ladder fuels or different plants growing from the ground up, even this low fire might just put itself out or wouldn't necessarily ignite anything else around it. We get a lot of questions about why bamboo is particularly fire hazardous. The challenge with bamboo is it's extremely difficult to maintain and all the leaves drop and form this perfect bed for embers to land and ignite. In addition, since bamboo is typically used as a privacy fence, it creates a continuity of fuel from one spot to the other and essentially acts as a net that makes it impossible not to catch embers. And when those embers hit the bamboo and drop, they're going to land in all this leaf litter. So for this demonstration, I'm going to use some dyed bark because I know how difficult it's going to be to pick this up. Imagine this dyed bark or burning embers blowing through the wind. As you can see, the embers landed in the top of the bamboo and deep within, creating a nest that will surely ignite as multiple embers are likely to get caught there. In addition, the mimicking embers are spread all over the leaf litter, which will easily ignite and spread to the bamboo fence, therefore carrying fire anywhere this privacy fence goes. Italian cypress, while prevalent in Marin, are also extremely fire hazardous. I have some dyed material here to demonstrate how embers blowing in the wind would land and impact Italian cypress. As you can see, the embers caught throughout this tree, and while Italian cypress it might appear green on the outside, it doesn't take much to pull it back and see just how dead they are. The, our mimicked embers can land in here and it would easily ignite as they nest, and then because of their height, they easily spread to other areas. 
Many plants can look green on the outside, when in reality inside they have dead woody material. They also can be poised to collect leaf litter. All of these things can be catches for embers and easily ignite. Another plant we get a lot of questions about are eucalyptus. And while in general, healthy mature trees are not considered large fire threats, because of the na nature of eucalyptus and how they shed bark that creates piles, as well as the difficulty to maintain the limbs up, they can pose a risk. However, if you have eucalyptus on your property, you may just need to spend a lot of effort to maintain them rather than fully remove them. As you can see through our, again, mimicked ember demonstration, when embers hit the tree, some might get stuck in the bark up top because of how rough it is, but a lot of it will end up at the bottom. So if you can maintain the leaf litter around the tree, you drastically reduce the potential of the eucalyptus igniting. Here in Marin, juniper is another very prevalent and fire hazardous plant. Because of the way it grows, it again acts as a massive ember catch. So let's demonstrate using this dyed material. As you can see, almost every ember is stuck in the plant. Juniper has a really high oil content, so it's very likely that had those been real embers, they would have ignited this plant, which would have spread very quickly. Junipers are often planted along driveways and roads, making them extra susceptible to roadside ignitions. A simple dragging chain or cigarette butt could easily ignite this volatile plant with a high oil content and interior woody material. As you can see here, if this was one spark, it could land in this leaf litter that's accumulated and easily spread up to these trees, lighting other things around it. Anywhere in your landscape that you notice leaf litter accumulating, like in this juniper, is somewhere to pay attention to. Just like leaves, embers can gather in similar places. So clear out the leaf litter and consider adjusting your vegetation to avoid accumulating leaf litter or a place embers could get trapped. While all plants have the potential to burn, healthy, well-maintained, and well-spaced plants are less prone to ember ignition. Take time to look around your landscape to determine what might be prone to ember ignition and adjust accordingly. Together, we can all help Marin adapt to living with wildfire. Well, as Quinn made very clear, the real villain in wildfires is actually embers. So all of us need to protect our home, and the best way to do that as a starting point is to clear flammable vegetation from around the home. So you go out there, you do a good job, you cut all that, but what are you gonna do with it? Fortunately, the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority has created what we call a curbside chipper program. You can sign up for it, and they will come and they will remove all that material for free. We prepared a short video which will explain exactly how that program works. Chip a day, chip a day, it's not hard. Chip, 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 chip. Removing wildfire fuel from your yard. Chip, 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 chip. Branch by branch and bush by bush. Chip, 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 chip. Make a pile out front for the chipper to crush. Chip, 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 chip. chip a day reduces wildfire risk. Chip, 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 Simple to sign up, it takes minutes. Chipperday.com backslash Marin. Sign up. We had a lot of fun putting together that little video featuring Chippy, the chipper truck. But on a serious note, we hope you all will take advantage of the curbside chipper program. You need to sign up at chipperday.com slash Marin. But a lot of us say, well, that's great. You can, the material can be removed, but what should I take out? Fortunately, the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority has created a program of home evaluation where trained inspectors will come out to your home and give you a detailed assessment so you know exactly what to do. Today, we have two of those inspectors with us. I'd like to introduce on my right here, we have Daniel Reese, and just beyond him, we have Nick Rodriguez. Guys, welcome. Thank you for Thank having you. us, Rich. Good. So we're going to do this a little bit differently. We have some photos that represent what people will see out there when you're doing your evaluations. We'd like to hear your comments of what the problems are and how people should go about fixing them. Sounds good. Great. So let's take a look at the first one. Daniel, I'll tell her over to you. What do you see there? Well, Rich, I see a large Italian cypress tree right up against the home there in what we call zone zero. And as we just saw in the uh, video, these uh, Italian cypress trees are extremely flammable 
and they're on a list of hazardous species that we'd like to see removed, um, especially that close to the home. And due to the flammability of the trees and how combustible they are, the best mitigation would be to remove the tree altogether. Um, if you're looking, if you're using the tree as f a form of a privacy screen or something like that, then they have a lot of great options on firesafemarin.com um, that you'd be able to reference and choose from. Along with that, with the, where the cypress is located, it's actually creating a ladder right into the house onto the IV that's uh, connected to the house. And if the cypress gets going, then it's going to connect to the house and it's almost unsavable after that. Yeah, that is a dangerous looking property. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, Nick, what do we got here? Um, first thing I see here is um, a bed of combustible mulch that's actually connecting to a uh, wood grating at the bottom of the house. Um, that's not what we'd recommend. If you're going to use a combustible mulch, make sure to have that mulch pulled back away from the house. Um, at least five feet uh, just with because uh, you're putting uh, a combustible material right next to your house. Yeah and uh, to add on to that the wooden lattice there at the base of the house is not something we recommend. We recommend a uh, metal screening so that we can uh, enclose off underneath the home there and uh, does not transfer fire from that mulch to the home. Right. right. So I see that's a very fine wood mulch. You know the, the pieces are really small almost like hair. Does that make a difference with mulches, how thick they are? Absolutely. We're definitely going for a thicker gauge mulch, anything bigger than an inch. Um, any of that smaller stuff is very receptive to the embers and is easily ignitable and uh, can cause a small fire near the home. Great. Well, and we can see this is right up against that wood lattice. How far back do you need to pull it to create a good space? So we recommend pulling it back five feet um, and then in that five feet area using a non-combustible mulch or even just bare soil all the way around. Great. Good. All right, let's see what else we have. Here we have a, um, looks to be a foundation vent to a home. It's what allow the home to breathe and not retain any moisture underneath. Uh, this is a traditional quarter inch style vent that actually appears compromised. Um, and what we're worried about with these is embers entering the home and uh, igniting any insulation hanging below the joist bay. So we like to see these upgraded to a finer mesh. Yeah, like Daniel was saying, not only is it uh, compromised, the mesh already al alone is a little too large and would allow embers in. What we're looking for is something uh, smaller than a match head. If you could put a match head in the uh, mesh, then it's too big. So anything smaller than that and make sure it's a uh, steel mesh. So I know there's a lot of things on the market for putting into these foundation vent openings. Can you explain what some of those look like? Yeah, so we can either go with a smaller gauge vent, uh, a 16th to an 8th inch vent, or you can go with an engineered vent, which would be a Vulcan vent, um, and they're actually treated with a chemical with a honeycomb material inside that it closes off when exposed to uh, direct heat to seal off and prevent any embers from entering. So stopping embers and direct flame. Exactly. Uh, that's a real plus. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> it goes without saying that we don't want all the little critters to get into the home through that space. Definitely, <laughs> definitely don't want the critters. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Whoa, this is really pretty dramatic. Wow. Um, first thing I see here is just a mass amount of brush buildup that seems to be what started the fire ladder um, and really got the fire pushing towards the house. Um, with, with the house where it's located on top of a hill uh, from what I'm seeing in the picture, Having some spacing between those shrubs is very, very important, especially um, the, the steeper the slope, you need more spacing in between each shrub. Yeah, so typically on a flat ground surface, we like to see two times the height of the shrub space. And as we get up a steeper slope, more spacing is required. Yeah, I'd have to say this is not an uncommon look in Marin County. You got a hole in the top of a hill. That's a lot of brush that hasn't been cleared down there. It's extremely high. So we're looking at brush that's really touching itself. Again, what's the spacing that we want to have with that? Uh, the spacing, again, is uh, two feet uh, or two times the height of the plant on a flat surface. And as you get steeper up the slope, uh, you want to start increasing that spacing. And that's just going to prevent any uh, preheating of vegetation above the slope as those flames uh, move uphill. So Nick, do you think there's some consideration also for what type of material you plant there? Oh, definitely. You'd want to plant something with larger, waxier leaves, something that doesn't hold a lot of dead material. Uh, definitely don't plant any juniper or cypress. Uh, those things tend to 
catch a lot faster, burn a lot hotter, and uh, move fire a lot faster, unfortunately. Yeah, and you can almost see there's an outside deck there, so it's just flying up the hill, hits the deck, and it's pretty much impossible to save the home at that point. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Great. Well, guys, thanks so much for visiting us with today. That's really helpful. And for those who are out there, I hope that you'll have an opportunity to interact with some of our inspectors out there. They really do a great job, and they are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. We have learned that the home evaluation program is a great way to find out what needs to be dealt with around your home. The problem is, how do we make these fixes? I think the good news is, oftentimes, it's very simple. So we have our do-it-yourself specialist, Aaron Harris, who's going to lead you through some of the basic steps you could take, all very simple, to make improvements to your home. Hello, people. My name is Aaron Harris, and I am the Fire Safe Marin Do-It-Yourself guy. I'm here to encourage you to do it yourself. Let's say there was a red flag warning. What would you do? Well, you'd walk around your house, take 15 minutes, clean up leaf litter, get ready to go so you can evacuate and feel good that your house is as safe as it can be during an ember storm. I'm here with Pat in the Sun Valley area of San Rafael and she has graciously opened her house to us to prep for red flag days. When the dry winds kick up, the fire danger goes up, and we want to make sure our houses are prepared for ember storms as much as they can be. Pat, are you ready to hit it? I am. Let's go. I'm ready. Let's do this. All right, Pat, let's start here. There's not a lot of combustible things up here, but the things that are really could put your house at risk. These jute mats are made of grasses and they have a wide space to catch embers. So this mat, if embers got it, would ignite and probably catch this um, door on fire and it could catch other things on fire. So if we can get rid of that, that'd be great. Also, this basket, that also is really dry and really combustible and that could ignite, then igniting this bench on fire. Uh, and so I think the best thing to do for all of us is just Bring all this stuff inside, especially on Red Flags Days. Okay, I love that little bench, so let's get it inside so it won't catch on fire. All right. I'll take this, throw it Those in. Those bowls. Let's go around here. All right, Pat, if you do evacuate, make sure this gate is left open because fire can travel across gates, and this will be a nice little fire break. Okay, I'll remember that. All right, Pat, I love this area of your garden. It's nice and calm. Let's talk about your deck. Let's talk about this basket. I think that could catch embers. If we could switch that out, maybe something metal. Do you have anything here that we could find? Well, it's old and rotten anyway, but uh, what are we gonna replace it with? I need something to hold the hose. Let's do this. Ooh. Is that Great okay? idea. All right, let's switch the metal out. Now also, I'm seeing quite a bit of leaf litter. You know, if we're in a red flag mode, we could take a couple moments, just blow this all out and feel good as if we do have to evacuate. Okay. All right, Pat, I love this back area, but I'm concerned about these chairs. On red flag days, I want I want you to bring any pillows outside. They just love catching embers and they will ignite. Okay. So we'll get these inside. And then I also feel like these chairs are in zone zero, the first five feet, and we don't want anything that can burn in that area. So if I can move them to another zone, I would love to do that. You okay with that? I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, I'll move them if you put those inside. All right, Pat, I got problems with the brooms. What's the problem? We have, it's a, it's a baby bonfire, really. So the, the kindlings on the bottom, those will, the embers can get right in there, ignite, and then they'll ignite this uh, stick on fire and then onto the fence and then into your eaves. Wow. Yep, it could be bad, but it's an easy fix. So well, let's just get rid of it. That's, I agree, yeah. I agree. Let's put them in the garage. 
All right, we have a common problem. Leaf litter building up underneath stairs. It's a concern because in this area on a high, dry, windy day, embers are gonna be swirling and they can get locked underneath and then fire can start. So the answer, a rake. Hey, I've got some right here. Let's do it. Let's get. Let me get underneath there, Pat. So we got an issue here. The openings of this mesh are too wide and embers can get through. You need to switch it, or better yet, I need to switch it, and I'll do that for you, uh, to an to a eighth or a sixteenth inch so okay. embers won't get through. Now, if embers, good. if embers are getting through, they're going to get into this wood we're hiding there. So we got to clear out all the wood and make sure there's nothing that can ignite in there that will ignite your house. Oh, I thought it was a great place to hide the wood. Let's move this into the garage. After you. Thank you. This gate is awesome. I love it, but you're putting kindling up against your house. Ooh. Is it okay if we move it to the back garden up against the rock fence? Uh, yeah, I love that old gate, but I like my house more. So yeah, well, let's move that. I think it's a cool piece, but we just don't want it on your house or in zone zero. Okay. Now, a lot of people don't know about this, but these trash cans are made with petroleum. And Ooh. if this zone was to ignite, this would burn really hot and could compromise your house. Okay, let's get rid of that close to my house. Uh, how about the wood that's behind it? Uh, Definitely, move that to? we'll just call that kindling. Let's get it out of there. Okay. We almost done? We're there, we're, all, we're back to the front. But before we do, we gotta check out this. There's a ton of leaf litter hiding underneath there, Pat. Oh, bother. I've been meaning to. I have a friend who talks about lifting up the skirts. I need to lift up the skirts of this bush so that we can get the leaf litter. That's edgy. That's edgy gardening, Pat. Let's <laughs> just clean this thing up. I'll go get the rake. Okay. All right, Pat, we've made it around to the front of your house. We've taken a lap and we've removed combustibles out of zone zero. We have moved brooms that could ignite and cause a fire. We have raked leaf litter. Wow. Do you feel a little bit safer? Aaron, I can't thank you enough. I really feel like I have learned a lot and I really feel like my house is safer. Well, it's not a one-time deal. We have to stay on it. After a wind blows, things can build up, so you just have to keep an eye for anything that could kindle fire. Yeah, I know. The work is perpetual. Remove fuels. Remove fuels. You too, folks, can remove fuels. Get out there periodically checking for leaf litter, periodically looking for anything that could kindle into a bigger fire. As we can see, there are some simple fixes that will make our home safer. Let's follow some of Aaron's tips and make sure there's nothing flammable right up next to the home. Now we're gonna shift gears a little bit and Mark Brown, who's the executive officer of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, is gonna give us some updates on the latest wildfire news in a segment that we call Firebeat. I'm Mark Brown, the executive officer with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. And throughout the state, all eyes are on the wildfire situation right now. And in locally in Marin, on September 1st, in Marinwood, just outside of the Lucas Valley, we had the Mount Lassen fire. And I really think the La Mount Lassen fire is a great example of a coordinated response between our law enforcement agencies, fire agencies, and just as importantly, the members of our public. So let's start with the members of the public. When they were uh, uh, signed up for Alert Marin, they were prepared to evacuate. They had to, worked on their defensible space around their homes. And so when they received the evacuation order from the law and fire officials, they were ready to, re to evacuate. They had their go bags ready to go. It was a very efficient evacuation. Now let's talk about the fire response. On a regular day like September 1st, weather-wise, every time that we have a vegetation fire that's dispatched, we have 22 pieces of equipment either driving or flying to that fire. Many of you watched the air attack that occurred with that fire. Well, that on every single dispatch, we have an air attack, two tankers, and a helicopter assigned to that incident to work on that. 
And so that was the standard response. So you can feel comfortable that when we have a fire, that we have a full and effective response coming. All eyes also have been on the Caldor fire moving towards South Lake Tahoe. And we've all watched on TV the evacuations of, the, of South Lake Tahoe. And there was so much concern that many homes were gonna be destroyed in Myers in South Lake Tahoe. And people are saying, well, we're really lucky that we did not lose a lot of homes in that fire. Well, I'll say that really wasn't luck. That was planned. The communities around South Lake Tahoe had a wake up call with the Angora fire. And they have been working on hardening their homes. They've created fenceful space around their homes. And uh, public officials have been working on shaded fuel breaks along the wildland ur urban interface boundary. So as you watch that fire under extreme conditions, it stayed up higher on the slope. It never got down into the communities. That wasn't luck, that was planned and that was an effective response. And that's what we're doing in Marin. The Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority is funding projects to create those shaded fuel breaks along the wildland urban interface boundary. We're working with our residents to harden their homes, to create defensible space around their homes. And we are actively building evacuation routes that are safe for our people um, under fire conditions. The recent fire in San Rafael Hill, from t the time of report to the time it was extinguished was 45 minutes. And it actually bumped up against a vegetation treatment a project that the MWPA funded. And I've spoken to some residents and they felt safe knowing that the fire was going towards that treatment area. I've spoken with the firefighters that knew that they had a great spot to access the fire and then to extinguish it there. And they also looked at homes and saw that there was great defensible space around those homes and knew that they were going to be able to save those homes should the wind direction change on that fire. In the Ross Valley, we have numerous evacuation route clearing projects. If you go into Corte Madera and drive around, you can see some of our projects. And in a project that happened last year in Southern Marin, up in Marin View, you can see what a shaded fuel break along the wildland urban interface boundary looks like. So we're doing our part as our law enforcement and fire agencies here in Marin, and we're asking our residents to do the same. Please harden your home and create defensible space, enroll for Alert Marin, and be ready to evacuate if you receive that order. So all of us have experienced red flag warning days. Red flag warning days are those days when it's very windy and all the vegetation is extremely dry. Unfortunately, those are also the days where typically the power goes out. That's because Pacific Gas and Electric Company is required to do what they call a public safety power shutoff so that they de-energize the lines so that in case a line falls down, it doesn't start a fire. So today, we have a few tips for you um, that should help uh, learning what to do. Um, but I have today my wife, Diana, with me, and Diana's gonna help me. Diana, how do you feel about it when the power goes off? Rich, I hate it, same as everybody else. But today, like you mentioned, that we have some tips that we use at home, which we hope they will help the, uh, everybody else in their homes too. I gotta give her a lot of credit because most of the stuff that we show her, she's really the one that found it for us. Okay, so the starting point is all of us know we need batteries. You need lots of batteries. There's so many devices in our homes that take simple batteries. Everybody knows D's, A's, C's, B's, all the rest of that, load up on them. Um, one really good use for these batteries, these are the larger ones, are to power devices like this. We typically think of a battery like this to be used for a flashlight. Well, flashlights are great into seeing into hidden spaces and whatnot, but when the power's out for a couple days, you want a light which is more typical of the light you would get in a room. So one of these larger lanterns is really effective for doing that. And then sometimes you need what I think of as almost a nightlight, where you would go out and you have a little bit smaller one, same principle, smaller batteries and whatnot, but you could put this in the bathroom or near the top of the stairs and whatnot, very handy. And then the last one that I like is this one. This is wall mounted and it turns on and off. I know Diana, you kind of like this. How do you I use it? I love it because I put it uh, by the light switch and I just flick it and it, is, it just gives me a lot of light. Well, I see uh, some other gadgets there. What yes. else have you got for us? Uh, we got the NOAA weather radio which help in case of um, a wildfire. It gives us uh, the alarm and it help us to prepare and, or get out of the house. So will evacuation orders come over that? Yes, they do. They do and uh, we need to follow them. 
What if the power goes out? Is that going to work? No, the beauty of this is that it has a battery backup. So you can put new batteries and, uh, you know, so that uh, you won't miss anything. Gives us a little bit of confidence when you go to sleep at night. If the power goes out, we're still getting a warning. That's right. right. Cool. And what else? Well, this gadget here is a charger for the cell phone, which is really, really necessary these days. And uh, it gives us like three to four charges, and then you can recharge this battery and it will last for a long time. It's great. Very, very handy. So we keep that charge up ahead of time, power right. goes out, use our phone, hopefully the phones are working, uh, but if they are, that can repower it again. Right. Great. And at the end, that looks kind of complicated. Well, this is my favorite gadget. This is great. This is an AM, FM radio, and also it is a NOAA radio. And the beauty of it is that it has quite a few lights. You know, if you had to get up in the middle of the night, also it has a uh, reading light and um, it works perfect. Yeah. And you can uh, connect your... Um, iPhone and recharge it there. So that will charge up a phone like the other battery? Yes, it will. Wow, that's quite a few things. So how does this get power? How do you make sure power is in that? Three different ways. It has a solar battery right here. It has uh, the rechargeable batteries that you just uh, plug the radio and then they will recharge by themselves. And then if you want to have some exercise because you haven't done anything because of that being worried about fire, then you crank it up. Just crank it up. Uh, and that works same as uh, with the battery or whatever. So it's it's perfect. Wow, that's really handy. It's a, it kind of combines all the features there. Yes, it does. Well, we got a couple more things to look at. Um, this is UPS, uninterrupted power supply. It's really just a giant battery. Normally, you just have it plugged into a typical outlet that's out there. And as you notice on this side, typical plugs where you can plug in. This is a great thing to plug in your computer, your Wi-Fi, your modem for the internet, telephone and so forth. So if the power goes out, this battery automatically kicks in and it has the right voltage to keep those things powered. It's not going to power them for two weeks, but it's going to be a significant amount of time. And how long it lasts really depends on how many devices you're running for it. So this is a really helpful device. And then last, we have the real grand of daddy of devices. There are people who rely on medical devices. And obviously, if the power goes out, that's a significant and serious problem for them. The Marin Center for Independent Living has a fantastic program, Powered and Prepared. You can enroll with the Marin Center for Independent Living. And when you do, if the power is going to be shut off, they can deliver these batteries to you. They'll set them up at your home, and this will power all your medical devices. You can see where they simply plug in here right now. It's just a fantastic way for an absolutely critical life-saving measure out there. So I hope anybody who might have a need to power a medical device takes advantage of the program from the Marin Center for Independent Living called Powered and Prepared. The contact information will be on the screen here, and they will be able to come out and help you by delivering one of these batteries to keep you powered during the next outage. So right now we have a short video that will give you some additional tips of how to weather, basically, a power shutoff. Here in Marin, we live with the risk of wildfires and need to be ready for power outages, planned and unplanned. This checklist will help residents minimize safety risks and inconveniences when the power goes out. Sign up to receive public safety power shutoff alerts at pge.com slash PSPS. Have a backup plan to maintain any electrically powered medical equipment like oxygen machines and electric wheelchairs. Keep a flashlight with extra fresh batteries. If you have a generator, ensure that it was installed safely and correctly. 
purchase and install a battery-operated AM-FM NOAA weather radio to monitor local radio stations for fire and emergency information, and be assured you will receive an evacuation alert even when the power goes out. Keep backup batteries for home telephones and internet routers. Keep important phone numbers in a convenient location. Keep your freezer full. After the power goes out, ensure your refrigerator and freezer stay cold by keeping the door closed. Maintain stores of non-perishable food that don't require cooking and remember to keep a manual can opener. Protect sensitive electronic equipment such as televisions and computers with surge suppressors. Download this checklist and find more tips, tools, and resources to adapt to wildfire at www.firesafemarin.org. At Firesafe Marin, we receive a lot of questions from the public. We try to get back to you very quickly. Here are some samples of typical questions that we get. Let's look at the first one here. My neighbor has a dead pine tree. I'm terrified that it's going to catch on fire and burn down my house. What can I do to make them remove the tree? This is probably the most common question that we get. And some of the, in some ways, the answer is fairly simple. If you're really worried about the hazard, the best thing to do is call your local fire department and they'll send out somebody to evaluate what the problem is. But the reality is a tree is seldom the biggest problem, the biggest threat to a home. As you've heard a little bit today, it's embers. It's not the burning tree next to your home. If the tree is very flammable and it's right next to your house, not saying that that's not a problem, but better off to focus your energy usually on looking at what's in the first five feet around the home, what might embers catch in, or is my, all my vents and everything properly screened around the home and whatnot. But again, I do wanna reassure you, if you have a big concern about a tree, please just phone your local fire department. Okay, let's take a look at another question. I live on a hill. At the end of our street is a dirt fire road with a locked gate. How can I get a key to the state so that I can evacuate if we have a fire? This is another one that we hear all the time. Absolutely, it is not a good decision to evacuate on dirt fire roads. Dirt fire roads are not made for automobile traffic. They're there for the firefighters to be able to get where the fire is. And dirt fire roads inevitably lead to where all the vegetation is. So you're essentially pushing yourself into the fire. And then once again, a lot of times the, dirts, uh, the dirt roads like that actually lead up the hill. And again, that's where all the flames are going. What we always recommend is you wanna to get to the lowest part of the valley, what we call the valley floor. We all realize that heat goes up, so does smoke. If you're at the lowest point, all that heat and smoke are going up and away from you. You might be stuck in traffic, but the best advice, stay in your car, the traffic will clear, and eventually you should be able to safely exit the area, but stay off of the dirt fire roads. One more question. I have a redwood deck. Is there any coating that I could put on it to make it fire resistant? So the problem is that the coatings which are out there, they're relatively short lived. It is true if you put something on just before a wildfire gets there, that can be effective, but they are quickly weathered by rain and sun, people walking on the deck and so forth. There's a lot of things that you can do to make your deck safer. You need particularly to pay attention to what is underneath the deck. There can't be any flammable vegetation there. You want to make sure that the deck itself does not have flammable furniture or other items on it, and of course it's kept free of leaves and small debris. So if you want to know more about that, we have some excellent videos on our YouTube channel that really get into quite a bit of depth about how to prepare your deck. But unfortunately, coatings, there's no magic wand that's going to work with those. So we're now at the end of episode one. We hope that there's been a few lessons which you have found to some value. If I had one action item as a takeaway for you, I would ask all of you to just walk around your home and look carefully at the first five feet. Is there flammable material there? Do you have mulch that can burn? Do you have furniture? Do you have firewood stacked against the home and so forth? Do you have open screens and vents? 
Just taking care of that, it's very simple and it's gonna help quite a bit to protect your home. We would love it if you took some before and after photos and send them in to us. If we will get back to you, thanking you for them and telling you what we see, and then hopefully we can use them on a future episode. So with that, that's the conclusion of Wildfire Watch. We look forward to joining you next month.